Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 11th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Tess and Mark Samatulski, authors of Clone Brews and Beer Capture, join us again. This time, the topic is hop varieties and hopping schedules. They'll help us make sense of all the different kinds of hops there are out there and when to use them in the boil and afterwards. Well, if you'll remember, last week, Kevin from Brookfield, Connecticut, wrote in to ask if there were a beverage similar to mead that he could brew using maple syrup instead of honey. Well, I got a couple of helpful replies to Kevin's question. Roy from Maryland sent a link to a page on the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension site that talks about using sap from birch trees, uh, which would be similar to using sap from maple trees, I would assume. The page describes a brew using birch sap with honey added to it. And I'll put a link to the page in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Roy also says he seems to remember a sap recipe in the Sacred Beers book. Macon from Toledo, Ohio writes, You had a question from a listener this week about making mead with maple syrup. It's called Acer mead. Acer, that's A-C-E-R, being the genus of maples. Uh, Check the index of your Papazian books. I'm pretty sure I've seen it referenced there. And uh, sure enough, I thumbed through my yellowed and well-used copy of Charlie Papazian's New Complete Joy of Home Brewing uh, that I've had for more than 10 years now, and I found this. Uh, Charlie Papazian says, uh, I also have had the pleasure of tasting beer made from maple sap instead of water. Fantastic, he says. The beer had a subtle woodiness to it, dry and crisp. So there you go. Sometimes the answer is closer than you think. Thanks to Roy and Macon for writing in. Chris from Cincinnati, Ohio, writes in to say, I recently had an allergy test that revealed some very disturbing news. I'm allergic to brewer's yeast. I began brewing with dried yeast and experienced major allergy problems. Uh, Chris says, I recently switched to a liquid yeast and have felt better. Do you have a yeast connection that could comment on my situation? Well, as you might predict, I turned to uh, my yeast connection, who has been very helpful in the past, Dave Logston of Y Yeast, uh, who has uh, always been kind to uh, take time to help answer questions uh, when we sent them to him before. Dave says, Yeast allergies seem odd, but it seems like there are new reactions every day. I do not know what the difference dried yeast would make compared to liquid cultures, other than they are often grown on different substrates. Dried yeast, usually from molasses, liquid from a barley base. That actually makes dried yeast suitable for use in gluten-free beers. And Dave continues, if the yeast were filtered from the beer, it may be much more tolerable and mitigate or eliminate possible allergic reactions. There are a number of small filtering devices available to home brewers, which might make a good investment for someone with this type of allergy. So uh, it may be worth Chris's while to investigate a filtering system uh, for his homebrew setup. Good luck with that, Chris, and thanks again to Dave Logston for helping us out. Brian from Marquette uh, writes, after hearing me talk about using my dishwasher for sanitizing bottles, Brian says, I too have been using my dishwasher to sanitize my bottles. I also found a way to bottle my beer in the kitchen without making a mess. I just open the door of the dishwasher and set up as many bottles as I can on the top side of the door. I use a footstool for my living room to put under the door so the weight of the bottles doesn't put too much pressure on the door and ruin the dishwasher. Then I just bottle my beer right there. Brian says if I drip any beer, it just goes right on the inside part of the dishwasher door and it cleans itself up with the next wash. I don't have to worry about getting all the sticky spots on my kitchen floor and upsetting my wife. (laughs) Just thought I'd pass that little tip along to all the homebrewing husbands who try to keep their kitchen under control while brewing so the ladies don't get cranky with us. Well, there you go. <laughs> Good advice uh, on uh, on a couple of fronts, on the brewing front and the marital front as uh, well. And I, I, I do the same thing, uh, open the door and, and bottle over the uh, dishwasher. Greg from Denver, Colorado writes on the topic of using the oven for sterilizing or sanitizing bottles. Greg says, I work with glass as one of my hobbies, both stained glass and fusing, fusing. 
And the important thing about heating glass is not to raise the temperature of the glass by more than 500 degrees an hour. That's uh, 260 degrees Celsius. So if you want to get the glass to 300 degrees, the bottle should be put into a cold oven and brought up to 100 for 15 minutes and raised to 200 for 15 minutes and then to 300 for 15 minutes and then the same process to go back down to room temperature. And for our metric listeners, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is around 38 degrees Celsius, so you can use that for stepping up uh, between those temperatures. Uh, Greg says it's a good task while you're boiling because you're in the kitchen for some time anyway. I just run mine through the dishwasher because I'm lazy, and that's the easiest thing to do. So <laughs> so it's good to hear from Greg, who actually knows something about a glass uh, from a technical standpoint. And uh, it's interesting that even though he uh, heats glass in his hobby, uh, he still uses the, uh, the dishwasher in uh, brewing. Uh, while we're on that subject, I got a comment from Pablo in Shelton, Washington, Pablo says, one suggestion, please differentiate between sterilization and sanitization. They are not the same thing. Well, good point, Pablo, and I'm, I'm sorry if I've confused the issue. Sterilization means everything is dead. Nothing is alive on the equipment, not even spores uh, that are dormant. Um, sanitization is essentially getting things so clean that most of the nasties, uh, hopefully more than 99%, are gone. Um, it's nearly impossible to maintain a sterile environment in, in home brewing, uh, at least in my kitchen it is. Michael from Wayland, Massachusetts writes, I've been home brewing for a bit more than a year, and I've been listening to the podcast since you started. I just wanted to tell you about a recent brewing project that you inspired me to undertake. After watching your six-pack of IPA series of video podcasts, I decided to do my own small batch experiment. However, instead of just making one six-pack, I decided to make five six-packs of single-hopped American Pale Ales uh, so I could do it all-grain. Essentially, what Michael did was to start brewing a standard five-gallon all-grain batch. Then, after boiling the wort for 60 minutes, he split it up into five separate one-gallon batches, uh, boiling different varieties of hops in each after that. He used Cascade, Amarillo, Centennial, Columbus, and Simcoe and he plans to dry hop using each variety as well. So uh, Michael will be able to test the flavor and aroma of the five varieties in the same wort. I, I think this is very clever. I've asked Michael to keep in touch with us to uh, let us know how his experiment goes along, and uh, I've asked if we can feature the results on a future podcast, and Michael agreed to that, and, and he's even offered to send, uh, send samples to us here so that we can taste uh, the results along with him. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. It should be very cool. So thanks to Michael for, uh, for doing that, and I'm looking forward to those results and testing those different hop varieties. And speaking of hop varieties, let's get on with our interview. Uh, David from the U.K. wrote in a couple weeks ago asking for a show on hop varieties and hop schedules, and I asked authors Mark and Tess Samatulski to come back on the show to help us out. Tess and Mark, welcome once again to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having Thanks, us. James. Uh, the question uh, this week comes from David of Romsey, Hampshire, United Kingdom. And he says, he suggests, how about a show on hops, the aroma, flavor, and bittering characteristics of different varieties and the most effective hop schedule? And uh, I had so much fun talking to you both the last time you were on that I thought I'd have you on again and, and uh, talk about this a uh, very wide and varied topic. Great. Well, thanks for having us again. Well, let's talk about this first. Let's start out talking about the role of hops in beer, and let's talk about the hop schedule. It it really does matter when you put the hops in, right? Absolutely. But for the main thing is hops in beer, the hops give it flavor. It gives it aroma. They also act as a preservative, and they also help in head retention. And also, the whole hops can act as a filter bed. And where you put your hops is, is very important in what qualities you're going to get out of them. If you're an extract brewer and you do a 60-minute boil, typically you put your bittering hops in at the beginning of the boil. Then you would put your flavor hops in 30 to 45 minutes into your boil. 
and the aroma hops can be put in the last five to one minute of the boil, and then if you want even more aroma, you can dry hop or you can do a hop back. But that's not to say that you have to stick to that schedule. You can deviate and, you know, you can put more hops in at, you know, at the end at five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes. So the possibilities are endless. And and why is it that, that you that you use those different times for those three different functions? Well, in order to um, hops have a, a resin in there, like um, a, a acid. In order to get bitterness out of a hop, you have to boil it to break down the acid and break down the resin and let those acids out. So you boil the hops just in order to get that bitterness. And usually for boiling hops, 60 minutes will usually get you pretty close to where you want to be for your total bitterness. And you should extract somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of that utilization of that bitterness out of the hops by boiling for 60 minutes. Some of your larger beers, like some of the new, um, like those double IPAs and some of the big things they're brewing out west in the United States, they'll boil those for 90 minutes or so because they do get a little more of that hop bitterness in the last um, 30 minutes. But it's still only a small percentage, maybe three or four percent. And for flavor. We usually like to throw things in for about the last 15 minutes. The flavor, the flavor of a beer, a lot of beers, flavor is an overpowering characteristic. When you taste it, you really taste a lot of hop flavor. And in that 15-minute range, it's where you've you boiled off some of the aroma, but you're, the oils are boiling off, but you're still tasting that, that flavor. As far as aroma goes, we like to throw usually aroma hops in for the last five minutes to one minute or even after you stop the boil. Um, and the later you throw it in, the more that hop aroma you're going to get. And um, it depends what kind of hops you use as well. You know, pellets, pellets are usually pretty good for bittering. They're usually about 10% more effective for bittering than leaves are, or actually not leaves. What we call leaves are really whole hop flowers. Leaves are what grows on a vine, and people often call them leaves like I just did. But <laughs> they're really the hop flowers. Um, if you're using bitterness, we usually like to use pellets just because you have a product that's giving you exactly what you expect. You haven't lost some of that bitterness. Um, Tess and I often like to use hot plugs or hot flowers for the flavor and aroma. If you throw in a plug, however, which is a compressed um, hop flower, you have to throw it in a little earlier than you would a leaf because it's compressed and you need to give it time to break up. And you, you can't find the compressed hops too much anymore. They're only made in England and it's hard to get them in the United States. And usually, if you're going to dry hop, we usually aroma hop as well. I think there is one manuf- manufacturer of the hop plugs in the United States. They just started. They're a new company. Yeah. But usually, what um, with the American hops, what they have been doing in the past is sending the American hops out to England, getting them put into plugs, and then bringing them back into the U.S. But there is a company now that is getting a lot of, they're, they're expanding, um, their whole line of hot plugs, which is which is nice to see because it's very easy because they come in half ounce increments, so it's easy just to throw in half an ounce. You don't have to measure it, you don't have to use a scale. Um, all you have to do basically is just break it up and toss it in. Yeah, it's almost almost kind of the best of both worlds uh, in in that regard. They're they're clean and easy to uh, to use, but you still get the whole hops. Right. But you just have to remember that if you are using them for bittering, the same thing as with the whole flower hops, you need to add 10% on to the bitterness because the pellets are right on on bitterness. If something called for, uh, let's say, 10, uh, 10 HBUs, you, you, you could do that exactly with plugs if you, if you, with pellets, I'm sorry, but if you use plugs, you have to add 10% on or a whole hops. And that's because they grind up the hops when they make the, the uh, pellets, right? They're concentrated, yes. And it, it's funny that you should uh, say that, uh, you know, a lot of people call them whole leaf hops. Well, some, some products are, are actually labeled on the package whole leaf hops. So <laughs> but, but it's, it's a natural. But hop leaves are the leaves on the vine. And, exactly. And the hop flowers are just the cone of the hop. Exactly. And I got called to, on that one time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I still say it now. No, Mark, Mark, you might get a call about Mark because he, he used hop, <laughs> hop leaves too. <laughs> Oh, it's funny what people get upset about, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> life short, believe me, that's the least thing you get upset about. <laughs> there are trade-offs uh, in convenience in using hop pellets and using whole hops. 
Uh, for instance, I, I've discovered that in, in dry hopping, I like to use the whole hops because they act as a filter when you're, when you're siphoning out of the uh, fermenter. Yeah, they're definitely better that way. I remember the first, second, second beer I made, I dry hopped just by throwing pellets in, in the bottles. And while it did have a really nice hop flavor, hmm. it was in a hop aroma. You were chewing pellets the whole time you were drinking the beer. <laughs> so we tend to use either plugs or leaves when we dry hop, and we put them in a hop bag just to contain them a little bit. And they get contained easily in a hop bag, much more easily than they would if it was a pellet in the hop bag. And I guess uh, it depends on your system and, and what kinds of uh, what kind of system you ha- you use and what kind of methods you use as to which ones that you uh, prefer. That's true. You know, a long time ago, when people just used the hop flowers, you'd have to pour the beer through like a screen in order to get the hops out at the end of end of the end of the mashing process, end of the boil, when you're about to put your beer into the fermenter. And when they did that, it would pull the hops back out of the beer. So that's how the, the hop back term came to, to be. Ah. And later on, when you started, brewers started using pellets, you couldn't use this process anymore because the screen would get clogged by the little pellets. So they had to start doing whirlpools to settle out all the, the bigger particles and the heavier particles. We were talking beforehand about uh, continuous hopping, and that kind of... Uh, Sam uh, Caligioni of uh, Dogfish Head, I guess, is the one that really uh, started that trend, or at least capitalized on that trend. And and instead of breaking the hop additions uh, into, say, once at at the beginning of the boil for bitterness, and then once, uh, say, halfway to 15 minutes before the uh, uh, end of the boil for the flavoring, and then right at the end for the aroma, he developed a machine to hop straight through and uh, he got some interesting results. Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> he has quite a flavor and quite quite an aroma. And in some beers where you may have a distinct flavor, a distinct aroma, he has like one continuous, just overwhelming flavor aroma profile. It's quite a hot profile. Yeah, I was reading an article where he used like an electric football machine for his first batch to actually shake the hops continuously into the beer. When we make something like that at home, we started uh, throwing hops in for the last 20 minutes or so because the last 20 minutes you're really not using too much of the alpha acid. Mm. I mean, maybe as little as 5%. And then we'd throw them in like every two minutes. You know, every two minutes we would throw hops in. While it's a small amount, it's still every two minutes just to make the beer and give the beer that nice, wonderful flavor and continuous hop you know, flavor profile. And you brought up a good point. Even when you're adding hops later on in the boil, you are getting some bitterness out of the hops. So it's not that the bitterness has to go for a full 60 minutes. No. I, I mean, I, I, I've heard stories, and you were talking about this before, James, where some people are late hopping. Now, you, you can't do that where you late hop, and you'd have to throw more hops in to get the same bitterness as you would when you throw it in for 60 minutes. If you look around, you can find some utilization schedules and utilization rate for hops. If you have like a 30 utilization, 30% for 60 minutes, you may have a 10% utilization or or less for um, 20 minutes. So if you're going to throw your bittering hops in at the end of the beer and get bitterness from them, you have to throw in two to three times as much. But by the same means, if you're throwing in a nice aromatic hop, you would get quite a flavor out of it, especially if you're doing you know, a, a nice Pilsner or a nice IPA or a, a beer where you really want that wonderful fresh hop, like a feel of the hops type aroma. Yeah, in, in this, uh, in the, the most recent issue of uh, Zymergy magazine, uh, Jamil Zainashev uh, has an article on late hopping, and uh, he interviewed uh, some professional uh, brewers who did this. And uh I'm having trouble remembering specifics, but I know that at least in a couple of them, they didn't put any hops or very few hops into the boil until like 20 minutes before the end. And then, like you said, because you're not getting the utilization, they have to put uh, two, maybe three times more hops to get their bitterness levels up at that point. But then you're getting those increased uh, aroma and uh, flavoring characteristics of the hops. Yeah, it becomes a little tough, too, because it becomes an expense after a while. You're actually throwing in, you know, triple the product, possibly. So 
economies of scale after a while would keep too many people from doing that, maybe except for specialty beers or things along those lines. I think basically on a, a homebrew um, schedule, if you wanted to do something like that, you might want to cut down your bittering hops and then start putting in like maybe double the amount in the last 20 minutes. But if you're only doing a 60-minute boil, I think that would make sense. Also, if you're using, if you're, if you grow your own hops and you're um, taking fresh hops off the vine, you would probably use three, three times as many hops for your flavor and aroma because they are green hops, but they impart such a different fresh flavor to the beer. If you know, if people do grow their own hops, there, some of our customers come in and they worry about, well, how can you dry your hops? And we just tell them, just take them off the vine, use three times as much, and don't use them for bittering because you're not sure what the alpha acid is for bittering, but um, definitely just throw them in for flavor and aroma, and it just it makes for an incredible beer. That's yeah, when they commercially pick hops, they're about 80% moisture, and when they dry them, just by sort of putting them on a screen and blowing hot air through them is a simple way of saying it, and you'll get down to about 8% moisture, and a pound of hops will weigh about three and a half ounces by the time you're done drying it, so it's like three or four to one, the difference between a fresh hop and a, a, a dried um, product ready for sale. Well, let's get into the uh, let's get into the varieties. Uh, David wants to know about uh, the aroma, flavor, and bittering characteristics of different varieties. So let let's start with bitterness. And uh, there's more than one thing to consider when you're. It's not just uh, one single uh, factor, bitterness. There are sub factors within there to consider when you're thinking about varieties, right? Right. Well, well, some hops, um, if you use them for bittering, they will impart some taste in the flavor and the aroma. So if you're a home brewer and you're looking to see what kind of hop you really would like, I would suggest that you would start with a very, very clean um, bittering hop, something that does not impart any flavor or any aroma, such as like German Magnum. Um, because that is a clean bittering hop with no distinct aroma character, and that's got a high alpha acid, it's like 12 to 14 percent, um, or U.S. Magnum, or something like that where they're, it's very, very clean. And then what you would do is, since you're not getting any flavor aroma from the bittering hop, then you would maybe use a, a flavor hop and then maybe an aroma hop, and you can use either the same flavor hop and aroma hop just starting off, to see if you like that hop, and then you can pick out the flavor, and then you can pick out the aroma because you're not going to get any 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 characteristics from the bittering hop. So let's let's name off some. You named one of the high alpha uh, hops. Let, go through go through a list here of, of your favorite, and we there's no way we can cover every hop that's out there. There's so many, but go through your list of your favorite high alpha hops. Well, I'll let Mark go because his favorite, absolute favorite bittering hop um, and all-around hop is Northern Brewer. So I'll let him talk about that, and then um, I'll go into some of the new varieties that that are, are hitting the market that are very, very interesting. Yeah, for some of the older hops, I used to like Northern Brewer quite a bit because I thought Northern Brewer really combined very well with flavor and aroma hops where it didn't overwhelm them. Some, some hops like Chinook, for example or maybe Target, when they're used for bittering, they sort of overwhelm the rest of the hops you're going to put in. So I would, I would like to stick with a good Northern Brewer as a basic, basic, simple hop. If I was doing a nice uh, American Pale Ale or an IPA, I'd throw some Chinook in and then add other hops as I went along because the Chinook would give you a little bit of aroma and a little bit of flavor, but then you're balancing that off with other aroma and flavor hops as well. In the past, we've, liked, we've used Centennial and Columbus or combinations of those, right through the whole boil. So we use a little Centennial and Columbus for bittering, a little Centennial Columbus and maybe Cascade for flavor, and the same three hops again for aroma. On the English side, it seems like a lot of English beers aren't too bitter, so you could start with a Ken Goldings or something along those lines, or, or um, a Northern Brewer, which is a nice, a nice um, English bittering hop to use as well. Um, but some of the newer hops, and one in particular that um, we got in maybe a couple of years ago, it's U.S. Amarillo, and it was one of our customers who was in the homebrew club, our local Yahoo homebrew club, um, made a beer, an Amarillo beer, and he used the Amarillo for bittering, flavor, aroma, hop back, and dry hop. And 
the beer was so phenomenal, we just like sold out of our Amarillo in, in a week. <laughs> and we had to keep ordering more and more and more because the Amarillo is a very, very nice hop. It's floral, it's citrusy, it's, it's 14 to 17% in some years, uh, alpha acid. Some years it's 8 to 11%. Um, and it just makes for a very, very nice beer. Another um, another hop is U.S. Warrior, which is a, uh, a newer hop. And when we were down visiting my brother in New Mexico, we were at the Blue Corn Brewery, and he made two beers that were really outstanding with this Warrior hop. And we were really surprised. We asked him why. Um, he, he made a wheat beer, and I think he used Warrior all through, didn't he, Mark? Yes, he did. It was, it was um, They made it with uh, New Mexican honey. But he actually used the U.S. Warrior for bittering, flavor, and aroma. And the reason why he used that was it's got a very mild hop aroma, but it's got very high bittering. It's like 15 to 17 percent alpha acid, and it um, so you don't have to use a lot, especially in a wheat beer. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, a very stable hop. Um, and some some brewers you use it in the U.S. ales, um, some pills. Um, you can use it in wheat beers. It's it's a very versatile hop. And he also made a brown ale with it, too. And um, we were really, really impressed with this hop. Um, another one is U.S. Vanguard, which is just coming into homebrew shops. It has an aroma that's similar to Hollow Tower. It's very, very mild and very slightly spicy. Um, and it's got a little lower alpha acid for, you know, maybe some of your... Um, you know, like your Munich Hells, uh, Kolsch beer or a wheat beer. And um, let me see. And there's uh, Horizon and Simcoe, which are also newer hops, too. Um, then you go to the organic. If you, you, know, if you want to make organic beers, there's the New Zealand Organic Pacific Gem, which has a, a slight blackberry aroma and a woody flavor. But, again, the alpha acid is up there at 14 to 16%. Um, so there's, you know, a bunch of new things, you know, coming out that um, are really good for brewers um, to try. Can can you talk about uh, what cohumulones are and, and how that affects the bitterness characteristics? In your hops, you have um, some isomers, humulone, cohumulone, and adhumulone. And they're all uh, the three main types of alpha acids, and they all do contribute to the bitterness of the hops. And what you really want to shoot for, I guess, the more cohumulones you have, the more bitter your beer, the more the more alpha acid you usually do have in your beer. So, you, but you try to get some of the newer varieties in general that have a smoother, cleaner uh, bitterness. And you know, I was reading a few articles about brewers, and some brewers will try a certain beer in the the, the a certain beer they brew with a certain hop, and different hops give them a different quality of bitterness. Like, you know, Grant out in um, out west in the United States, he thought that Mount Hood gave him the cleanest bitterness. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a difference in what kind of beer you brew and where you brew and where you get your hops from as well. The, the, the advantage and the, the, the bitterness you do get out and the quality of the bitterness out of the hops. And in Amarillo, um, even though the alpha ha- acid could be as high as 17%, it's got very low cohumulone. So with that, you're not getting the harshness that would be associated with a, a hop that's that high in alpha acid. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that I've read and, and talked to people that say that the high cohumulone levels uh, are responsible for more of a harsh uh, bitterness. Um, and it's interesting that, that bitterness would be so complex. You think it, things were, were either off or on. It's either bitter or it's not. But there's, you know, there's... But there is different, there's different ranges of bitterness. And that's why um, you can go on some of the websites of the hop, hop sellers, and they will actually give you the um, cohumulin um, uh, ratios. Let's say for Northern Brewer, the alpha acid is um, 8 to 10 percent the beta acids are 3 to 5%, but the cohumulone is 20 to 30% of the alpha acids. So, again, that's a little bit higher than if you go to magnum, the cohumulone is 24 to 28% of the alpha acids. So that's a little bit lower. So that would be a little bit cleaner of a beer, even though the alpha acids are higher at 12 to 14%. Now let's talk about flavor. What, what kinds of flavors uh, can we get out of hops? Uh, 
<laughs> you have another hour. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, we have the general categories of spicy and uh, and citrusy, uh, but then I guess you can break it down, you know, even further. Oh, there's there's even more. You can get um, like with Brewer's Gold, you can get black currant. Um, you can get grapefruit again from from Cascade. If you're going to use Centennial. Um, you can get floral and citrus notes, um, and if if you want to, you can use to get like to get it's called the Super Cascade. And if you don't can't get Centennial, you can use like 70% Cascade and 30% Columbus to get a Centennial type of hop. Um, you can get spicy, piney, resiny. You can get uh, a pungent aroma like U.S. Columbus. Um, you can get. Uh, a woody, fruity flavor from Fuggles. Um, you can get a mild, delicate, like the English hops. They're very mild and delicate and classic. Uh, some are flowery, like Hollitower. So it, it just, you have to do your homework, but it just really, really ranges in, in, in flavors. And if you, what you do is, what I like to tell people is, the only way that you're going to know if you're going to like this hop is that you use a clean, bittering hop and then you use the hop all the way through the beer. And then you taste the beer, and if you say, I really like this, then you know what it tastes like. But if you're going to throw in, like, five different types of hops, you know, you've got so many things going on, you're not going to know. And also, the style of the beer would, in some cases, dictate which type of flavor hop you want to use. For an English pale ale, you know, you would stick with something like a Ken Golding's or a Willamette or something that they've tried before. For a Pilsner, you'd want to use Saz. As you start going to other styles, things can vary more. Some combinations of hops are very nice. Like in New England, all of the IPAs and all the pale ales for years had Cascade and Willamette. That was their blend. That's what they liked. Some of the wheat beers have nice blends, too. You could put a little Perle in there. You could blend that with um, Spalt or a couple other hops, and it gives you this real wonderful, complex, spicy flavor. And once again, it's it's your opportunity to, to play with flavor hops and to see what you like. And like Tess was saying, you can make a beer all the way through and see how that hop tastes. Another thing you can do is you can take a very light beer that you buy in a store and just uncap it and throw a few hop pellets in and then cap it. And let it sit there for a couple of weeks. Then later on, try, try that beer and against a couple other beers you've thrown different hops in. And it really gives you an idea what kind of flavor you're going to get out of, out of that hop. Now, that's interesting. And this way you don't have to brew five gallons of beer that you really hate. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask if there was a shortcut, uh, but that sounds like a great one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would actually be a really nice class to give, and I've always wanted to give that class where I just take, like, a case of Budweiser and then, and then in every single bottle throw a different type of hops, throw some hop pellets, and then when, in front of a bunch of people try it later on and say, what do you think this hop is? What do you think that hop is? And take notes on what characteristics it gave to the light beer. That's really interesting. Um, you were talking about using a uh, using a, a single hop all the way through. A good example that I had uh, recently, a friend of mine did a wheat beer uh, and did uh, Amarillo all the way. He did like five hop additions, mm-hmm. and he called it his grapefruit juice beer and <laughs> because it tasted almost exactly like grapefruit juice. It was I'd never tasted anything like it. It was it was just like drinking grapefruit juice. The Amarillo gave it that right. What yeast did he use? Uh, you know I don't know. Uh, I I would have to check. But because uh, Amarillo is citrusy, mm-hmm. but it also could have really intensified the citrus by the um, by the yeast that he used too. Uh, that's true. That's true. You know one other thing about hops too. It's like any other ingredient in anything else you're making. You want to have a balance, and you want to use the right amounts. In a, different beer styles tend to take a different amount of hops. If you're making an IPA, like an American IPA or a super IPA, and if the gravity is 1.090 for original gravity, in general, you want about 90 IBUs of hops. Because for an IPA or super IPA, it's pretty much for every unit of gravity, you want a unit of IBUs. For other beers like nut brown ales or like malt liquors or things like that, they're about 50%. So if you have a, a 70 starting gravity for the, the beer, you have a 35 IBU that you're going to put in. And there, there's a balance that runs between beers that, that makes it pretty easy for you to figure out how many hops to put in to the beer when you're making it. As far as, like, adding flavor hops, and if you add a lot, a lot of flavor hops, 
in a lot of aroma hops, you may overpower the basic beer style itself. When we first started making English ales, I was always throwing for a five-gallon batch an ounce of flavor hops, an ounce of aroma hops, and my hops totally overwhelmed the malt profile. Mm. So when making these lighter beer styles, you, you, even though it feels a little funny making it, you may want to throw in a half to a quarter ounce for flavor and a quarter ounce for aroma or a half an ounce of, of hops because it overwhelms the beer. And when making a porter or a beer like that, you may not throw any flavor or aroma hops in because you want to taste them all. You don't want the hops to overwhelm them all and overwhelm that roasted character. Another thing to think of, too, is when you're doing a roasted grain beer, the roasted grain gives a little bit of the, the bitterness to the beer as well. Mm. So you want to balance that off. That's true. Uh, in the same way that the that the yeast would give a, a contribute to the uh, citri uh, or to complement the the citrus flavors of the hops, the uh, the roasted grains could uh, complement the uh, the bitterness as well. Sure. Now, yeah, like some of the yeast, like the Belgian yeast and the and the wheat beer yeast, they've got so much character, and they've got green apple, and they've got spice, and they've got all these characteristics that it's really really hard to to even tell what are you tasting are you tasting hops are you tasting yeast that's why if you're going to make a beer where you really want to taste the hops and smell the hops you should use a very clean yeast like uh why is 1056 american uh 1007 german ale because they're clean yeast and they don't really impart any kind of of flavor to the beer or aroma i mean if you're going to use like a forbidden fruit yeast or if you're going to use um any kind of you know Belgian yeast or like a wine siphoner yeast, it's going to impart all these flavors and aromas. So it's best just to make a, a nice, clean, lighter beer, um, and this way you can really get the character of the hops. Just like in cooking, you know, you can overdo the spices or the flavorings in a dish. Absolutely. When you know sometimes the best dish is a simple dish. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know sometimes maybe the the best beer is a, is a simple beer. Absolutely, and in cooking too, you don't want to cook. With a very high, hot, you know, a hoppy IPA, because it's going to, if you're doing a chicken dish, you don't want to do that because it's going to overtake it because chicken is mild. So you really have to kind of, you know, think of what you're doing. I mean, you know, if you're doing a curry, you can do a bolder beer. If, you know, if you're doing something very light and flavorful like a fish, you want to use like a Belgian wit beer or something like that. But again, I'm getting off into my cooking tangent. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now let's talk about. Uh, are you ready to, to move on to uh, the aromas? Sure. Let's talk about, and don't forget to name names. Okay. Let's talk about the uh, the aromas that you can get from hops. Again, you can you can get um, you can get a resiny aroma. Let's say from um, like a New Zealand organic hollow tower. You can get a very woodsy aroma from maybe a Fuggles or Kent Goldings. Um, you can get a clean aroma or no aroma, aroma at all from German Magnum, um, from a German Hollow Tower, uh, very mild and pleasant, which is, you know, German Hollow Tower is a classic uh, German hop. If you're going to make a, a, a Bavarian-style lager, you would use something like that, or you, if you're going to just make a, a Weizen beer, you'd use a German Hollow Tower hop. Um, some of the newer hops, uh, the U.S. Newport, it's high in alpha acid, but a very, very mild aroma. Um, if you're going to use U- U.S. Santium, it's got a floral aroma with a slight spice to it. Um, if you're using U.S. Simcoe, it's got a very, very unique aroma. It's almost like smelling a pine tree. Ah. So it might be good for a Christmas beer. Mm-hmm. Um, Sterling, it's very herbal and earthy um, with just like a hint of floral. Um, Tetanang, slightly spicy. Um, Warrior, again, a very, very mild aroma. Um, there's one hop which has got a very, very resiny kind of character with woody. Um, and like Columbus has got a very pungent aroma. So some of these aromas are very, very, very intense. Like Chinook, it's got, it's got a medium intense aroma, but it's got piney and it's got distinct grapefruit. So you have to think if you want those kind of aromas, if you like those, and you kind of have to see if it's going to pair with your malt. And also, you have to have a good malt backbone if you're going to, to support some of these aromas. Because if you have a very thin malt backbone, the aroma is just going to power the whole beer, and all you're going to be doing is smelling piney, resiny, floral, spicy, and you don't want that. The most important thing in beer is it to be balanced. 
I mean, you don't want shock value. You just want a really nice drinking beer. I went out to the Great American Beer Festival and uh, was invited to a, um, a gathering at uh, uh, the Brewers uh, Association out there, or the Brewers uh, Supply Group. And they had um, sections of hop bales out on a table so that you could, you know, grab a handful and rub them in your hands and, you know, really get a smell of, of what these different uh, uh, hop characteristics, these different varieties, the different characteristics that they had. And it's and it's a shame that you can't do that in the homebrew store environment. Sure you can. You can? <laughs> Why couldn't you? <laughs> well, it's, you know, I don't, I don't know uh, if, you know, most homebrew stores uh, or owners would, would uh, like you to pour out, you know, a handful of pellets and, and smell them. Do you do that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, why not? I mean, you know, we're not going to resell the hops that people are, like, squishing in their hands, but <laughs> hops are not a very expensive commodity. And if we can help someone brew a better beer or beer, brew a beer that they want, I have no problem pulling out hops and, you know, letting them. I mean, people chew grain all the time at our store. Why would I not let them, you know, roll some hops in their hands? It's it's a great way to educate them, and I don't want them to buy a hop that they're not going to like. Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Try it before you buy it. There you go. Now, is, is that the best way to 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 te- We talked about putting the the hop pellets in the beers to to test the flavor. Uh, is that the best way to uh, test the aroma of That's the, the second best way. The best way to do it is, and we're not going to do this for you at our store, I mean, we'll just only go so far, is just <laughs> taking a one-pound bag of hot pellets and just cutting it open, and as soon as you cut it open, sticking your nose right in. And that's where you're going to get a huge, huge aroma. Mm. And that, you know, when uh, a lot of times my manager, Bud, will, you know, be making up some of our clone brew kits, and he'll open up a bag and he'll rush out and say, smell this, and, and it's like kind of guess the hop kind of thing. Mm. But that way is is the best way. So, um, of course, you know, you're not going to get anybody to do that at a home brew store unless <laughs> they're just opening up another bag of hops. But that you can really, really get the full, you know, appreciation of the aroma. But taking the hops and, and rolling them in your hand is, is the second best way. And nowadays, too... They have um, hops they seal, vacuum seal, so you can get a really nice flower hop and really smell it and taste it and roll it in your hands, and it's still in great shape. When I started brewing 15 years ago or so, a lot of the hop flowers you get were pretty shot. Mm. They lost some of their characteristics. They were turning like an orange color, which isn't good, and you know they had lost a lot of um, the aroma qualities that they could give you. Nowadays, with the vacuum-sealed hops, you can... Pop those right open, those bags, and get a good whiff of that as well. And and, and when you put the hops in your boil, those aroma uh, compounds start coming off pretty quickly. You know, so you can you can start. <laughs> of course, it's too late because you're, those are you know they're out in the air and they're not in your beer anymore. But yeah, you you're can, losing them quickly. You can get a good indication of what aromas those uh, hops are going to give you uh, at that particular time. Right. But you're also getting some malt in there, and you're also getting a uh, steam facial. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, but you, if you do put your hops in and then just smell it right away, you will get a, a good indication of what the beer will smell like. Now, the, we talked uh, a bit a bit before we started recording. Uh, people mentioned noble hops. Mm-hmm. What what are noble hops? In general, noble hops were known as your lower acid hops that gave you uh, a flavor, it gave you an aroma, things you were going to use just for flavoring and aroma, uh, and uh, giving your beer aroma. Um, nowadays, noble hops, the, the term is going away a little bit because a lot of your higher alpha acid hops are also good for flavor and aroma as well. So whereas traditionally you, know, you had a lower, a lower alpha acid hop as your noble hops, such as Saz or you know, King Goldings or Tettinger, nowadays, you can also use your higher alpha acid hops as a noble hop because they do have great characteristics. And it could be because of the way the hops were, be, the hops were being made. They, they've developed hop strains over the, the course of the last you know, 10, 15 years. They're really quite um, astounding. They've made a lot of progress. So are there any other hop terms out there that uh, people might come across when they look at when they come into the homebrew store they come into or they are looking through a website or or a recipe are there any other uh, things that they should be thinking about when they're uh, thinking about hop selection well i think they should look look at the alpha acid of the hops i think they should look at how they're packaged 
Um, I think they should decide what form they want to use them in. And um, I think they should ask questions. And I think they should look at basic styles. And, again, styles are there for a reason because they taste good. So I think if they have a commercial beer that they really, really like, they should find out what hops are in those and then just make a beer with those hops. Yeah, with web pages, so giving so much information these days, you can taste your favorite beer and try to look up and see what hops they did use for that. And that's a good way of determining how you want to make the beer that is going to be your home-brewed beer. And nowadays, pellets last a long time, so if you go to your store and the pellets are refrigerated and they're sealed nice and tight, you know you can keep those pellets for a while in your own freezer, double bag them and use them as you wish. Uh, make sure that when you look at a leaf hop, it's not orange, and, and, and it should have, like a, if you compress it, it should uncompress a little bit and leave a little resin on your hands. So you can check your hops to see how they look and see how they smell and see how they are before you buy them just to make sure you're making your beer with a good quality hop. It's kind of like looking at your at your fish's eye in the in the fish uh, cellar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, I I certainly appreciate the uh, the time again. And incidentally, uh, at the ba- on, in both uh, clone brews and beer ca- capture, there is a there are hops uh, guides mm-hmm. uh, back there as far as uh, you know what the what the hops are traditionally used for and uh, what you can substitute. Uh, and that's very important because sometimes, you know, especially if you don't live near a big city or have a big homebrew store in your town, it's um, it's hard to get all kinds of hops. So it's nice to know what you can substitute. Yeah, substitution charts are nice. And also, what I do sometimes, I look at a lot of recipes on a beer style I like, and I try to see what type of hops they use for bittering, what type of hops they use for flavor, what type of hops they use for aroma, and how much they used of each. And then I could use that as a guide for what I want to do when I go to the store to buy ingredients for my own beer I want to make. Or if if you're like me, you've got, you know, half a dozen, six or eight uh, uh, jars of, you know, an ounce here, half an ounce here, (laughs) three quarters (laughs) of an ounce there of uh, of hops that, you know, have been in the freezer for a little while and you want to get, you know, you want to use them. Uh, So it's nice to know uh, kind of what goes with, with which. Absolutely. But also, there's, there's some of the, especially the European brewers, are starting to use different kind of hops. Like one beer that, that just came into Connecticut, it's called Hublin Dublin IPA Triple. And it's by a very famous brewery in, um, in Belgium, uh, the Shoot Brewery. And what it is is they're using American and, um, and, and, and Czech hops. They're, they're brewing it in the English tradition, and they're of an IPA, and then they're, they upped it to make it an imperial IPA, and then they brewed it in the classic Belgian way. So they're actually they're using tomahawk, which is a, a new um, American hop for bittering and flavor, and they're adding um, Czech saws at the last 10 minutes of the boil, and they're, absol- they're dry hopping it with amarillo, ah. <laughs> which, is, which is amazing, but it really uh, it comes together. It's a very, very nice beer. It's it's a new world. It is. It is. <laughs> but it, it's exciting to taste some of these new beers out there. Well, excellent. Again, I, I, I appreciate you guys' time, Tess and Mark Samatolsky, and uh, hopefully uh, we can talk again. Great. It's, it's been great, James. Thank you so much for having us. Well, thanks again to Mark and Tess Samatolsky for their help. They are the authors of Clone Brews, and Beer Captured, and they also own Maltos Express Home Brewing Supplies in Monroe, Connecticut. And you'll find links to all of that in the uh, episode description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Well, for this, uh, for next week, I'm working on a show to start talking about home brewing equipment in more detail, what you absolutely need to get started, and what is good to have beyond just the basics. If you have brewing questions, uh, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find new pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, We take you through the all-grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. 
You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. Thank you.